And that then led to the, if you like, the outcome from the research, which is a seven-step model on mitigating ethical risk. And that's what I'd like to run through with you now. The basic factor here, then, is a CEO who believes that business ethics are really, really important. If you haven't got that, this seven-step model won't work and can't work. In fact, I'd suggest that if any of us are working uh, in an organisation where the CEO doesn't believe ethics are important, maybe it's time to think about working in another organisation. Step one. The person chairing the company is absolutely rock-solid, sound in terms of their personal ethics and integrity, and they will select and lead a strong board as a result. Step two is all about the directors, the non-execs and the execs. Ethically sound executives uh, who will work with ethics at the heart of everything that they do at the board. Step three is about <coughs> governance, strong governance processes where the board isn't just ticking boxes, they are genuinely interested, they are involved, they ask appropriate questions and they develop a relationship with management. That way, management will engage to the extent that they think the board really is going to find out what's going on one way or another. And so the chances are that the governance processes uh, are more likely to work rather than simply, yes, we've done this, done this, done this, done this. This might help in terms of a demonstration of people's ethics. So the fourth step in the seven-step model is about <coughs> signalling. So it comes back to, to your point earlier on in terms of what of signalling. So very powerful signals come from the behaviour, the actions and the decisions of the directors, particularly the CEO. And from the interviews with all these chairmen, uh, some wonderful examples came to light. So naming of board committees. One chairman said, before I arrived, there was no corporate social responsibility committee, no ethics committee, but now I've got complete alignment of the whole board. That sent a signal. Membership of board committees. If the CEO is on the ethics committee or the corporate responsibility committee, that sends a signal to the organisation about what's important because of that individual devoting time and energy to that. Appointments and communication around appointments and the signal that that sends both overtly as well as covertly. So one chairman, uh, this is a financial services company, said to me, well there's one individual who'd spent years in their career building up to this fantastic job, came available, succession plan, everything was going really well, but there were a few residual questions. Nothing wrong with the person, but just a few question marks. Technically, they were outstanding, but in the end, they decided to appoint someone else who was technically less qualified for the role, but whose ethics were absolutely beyond reproach. Apparently, that sent reverberations around the world that lasted months. So, signalling from appointments. <coughs> agenda items. What's on the agenda? That sends a clear signal. Uh, an example fairly close to home is that I worked for an organisation at which health and safety was the first item on every single agenda for every meeting at any level anywhere in the world. Over a five-year period, the incident and accident rate fell nearly 80%. And that took the company's performance in health and safety from pretty pedestrian and lacklustre to bordering and knocking on the door of world-class performance. Board training sessions. Well, if you're rolling out a global anti-bribery and corruption training program, as many companies have, there's a signalling opportunity from the board having exactly the same training as the employees at all levels. And that way, perhaps somebody on the other side of the world would say, well, maybe I will attend the training, because if it's good enough for the board, maybe it's good enough for us. And if it is the same, maybe they'll ask me questions about what I thought about it, so maybe I will play ball. External ethical audits. Well, that's where you bring in an outsider to do a review of ethical practices and the levers <laughs> of the tone from the top, remember that little table, and ask them to comment and make recommendations. 
And again, one chairman I spoke to said that when he arrived, he hired a very, very eminent person from the legal profession to do an external ethical audit. And he sent a signal by saying, this individual hasn't yet started doing this project for the company, but I'm making a promise even before that point. And the promise is this. Sight unseen, I'm going to implement every single one of their recommendations. So that sent a signal. Information requests. Uh, over many years, I had the pleasure of sending to company chief executives and chairman and boards a monthly statement of what I called extreme disciplinary action. So it's just a one-liner on each individual case. So name, job, why did we fire them, or whatever the uh, penalty was, if you like. Uh, what was the issue, or what was at stake, and what actions are happening to prevent its recurrence? So nothing particularly spectacular about that. However, over a period of time, the board gets a smell and a flavour of what's going on. And so they could say, well, that geography or that business unit or that product group seems to have very little representation. This geography or this business unit or this line of business seems to have very high representation. And that's kind of in the middle. So do you know what's going on? Have you got a management issue? How do we compare and contrast? And they built a picture of what was the kind of ethical barometer in the various businesses. And then symbolic actions that communicate a commitment to do the right thing. Uh, Mark and I once worked for an American chief executive who uh, took me aside one time and said, a wonderful phrase, he said, Ian, let's face it, one sacking is worth a thousand memos. <laughs> and then finally on signaling, um, use of input and output measures, which I think is very, very important and a huge opportunity. So what do I mean by input and output measures? Well, input measures are what is being done to reduce ethical risk. So have you got your code of conduct and your whistleblowing policy, ethical audits? Do you ask questions about ethics in assessments and so on? Output measures are people in the organisation acting ethically. And perhaps the, the acid test is how many people are invited to leave because of ethical shortfalls. That then is signalling, and, and I hope that answers your, your question from before. Step five out of the seven-step model is about reducing bad apples. In other words, how do we have ever fewer employees with inappropriate ethics? We've got some input measures here. First of all, recruitment processes. Do they include an assessment of the ethics of the candidates? And this is especially important, uh, and such uh, recruitment activities need to be inventive and rigorous, particularly for senior appointments. Do assessment processes, such as appraisals or assessment centres, provide data on ethics and integrity? Do employee records contain information on ethics and integrity? What of the whistleblowing policy? Is it kind of locked up in a whole load of administrative detail? Or does it really enable people to speak up and speak out about things deeply troubling them at work? Are there clear disciplinary and dismissal policies that visibly are seen to apply equally and fairly at all levels in the organisation? And finally, are there clear policies on communicating reasons why people go? It's perhaps not terribly helpful if you fire someone for having their fingers in the till and then put out some eulogy wishing them well in spending more time with their family. <laughs> so that's part of a very important assurance aspect in terms of reducing the risk and ultimately removing bad apples from one's organisation. But there's a problem. And the problem is that takes bravery and guts. And the reason why it takes bravery and guts is because many people whose ethical compass is somewhat distorted tend to start off down a thin end of the wedge and start going down a slippery slope. 
And some people turn a blind eye, and then things develop. But they keep turning a blind eye, or they're too busy to go on to the next. And I think one of the scourges of the modern world is that we've got so much data coming at us all the time that everyone has a shortened attention span. And so you see something that's not quite right, but you're too busy and you move on to something else. So I think it's important just to reflect for a few seconds on the need for bravery and guts. Foolish apples. Well, these are the people who unthinkingly do the wrong thing. And so what's so important here is the need to identify situations where they could do the most damage. And so input measures here are, are their codes of conduct particularly tailored to those high-risk areas? Are the people given extra training? Are there extra ethical elements in the performance reviews or assessments that take place? What of the remuneration and incentives? Need to be careful it doesn't inadvertently uh, create temptation or pressure to cut corners. Are there special whistleblowing elements for those high-risk areas? And what of management attention and controls and approval processes? And finally, are there particular processes for reacting to ethical breaches and then capturing the learning to prevent recurrence? So again, some quite important assurance processes for reducing the incidence of foolish apples. And I regard that as a, a really quite a different category of ethical problem compared to the bad apples. So the, the last step in the model, reducing pressured or tempted apples, this requires deep knowledge of the organisation, the business, the business process, but above all, the people as individuals. What's likely to cause them to become tempted or feel pressured to do something that they shouldn't? Again, we should identify situations where performance pressure or reward could cause them to take shortcuts. And sometimes there's the pressure of success, where people are constantly striving to always beat target because they always did beat target. Well, look what happened to Enron. Identify situations where people find it hard to be objective or to act with integrity. And identify situations where their judgment might be impaired by self-interest. And there's this wonderful quote that says it's impossible to get someone to do something when you're paying them not to do it. So there's an alignment of reward and incentive there. So once again, we've got some input measures for our three categories of bad apples, foolish apples, and tempted apples. And the final element on, on assurance is around the output measures. So how many times do ethical audits identify problems? What are the whistleblower incidents? What of near-miss things that you capture before they become really problematical? What of the, the not near-misses, where things do go wrong? What of the areas in the business where there are low scores in the employee survey? And as I said earlier, the ultimate measure, how many people are invited to leave because of bad ethics. So that's the, the seven-step model in mitigating ethical risk. Finally, in this conversation with these chairmen, we talked about who are the stakeholders who collectively can help in the application of risk mitigation. So we identified <laughs> some stakeholders that are listed on this page and came up with a series of recommendations to each of those stakeholders. So if you're chairing the company, assemble and develop a first-class board and assess your eth ethical risks. We've got a few other recommendations there as well. The senior independent director is there to coach and guide and act as a bit of a counterfoil for the person chairing the organisation. So ask questions about the board's strategy for setting a good ethical tone, a strong tone from the top, and encourage follow-through on both process and behavioural issues. Non-executive directors show courage to be independent. Uh, I spoke to Philippa Foster Black, who runs the Institute for Business Ethics, and I said, if there was one thing that you'd like to see more from non-execs, she interrupted me, and, and it, it, it was, be brave. 
develop these relationships with executives below the board without treading on the toes of the CEO, and then you, you tend to find out what's going on. Executive directors should encourage the CEO to provide strong ethical leadership and ensure that <coughs> learning is captured and brought back into the organisation. And we've got quite a few people from HR in the room, so a few pointers for HR colleagues in terms of driving for a values-based culture via and through the CEO, so, such that it's not seen as a kind of HR initiative or flavour of the month. Coach board members on how their behaviour and the signals they send are being interpreted. Learning and feedback mechanisms, they're important. And ensure that HR processes have an ethical element within them. So do the assessments or performance reviews contain measurement of ethical matters. A couple more, if you're a regulator, be prepared to discuss ethical issues with the companies and encourage them to monitor and report. And finally, if you're an investor, look out for companies with a strong ethical tone because really they ought to be a slightly less risky investment. So those are the messages for the, the key stakeholders. And if we then draw some themes together in conclusion, um, I think that the tone from the top applies to all leadership teams, not just to boards. So at almost every level in organisations, um, the, the risk of reputational damage from bad apples, foolish apples and tempted apples uh, can be quite severe. Also, the financial, legal and regulatory consequences can be uh, pretty dire. JP Morgan, as you may know, were recently fined 13 billion dollars and that came on the back of an earlier fine of more than a billion dollars and so the story goes on but there are wider issues of stakeholder trust reputation uh, the brand promise and so impact on intangible assets I think is very very important the flip side though is that the benefits of ethical business can be huge and so enhanced reputation there's one organisation that's actually represented in the room which very overtly walked away from, shall we say, dodgy business in one country as it progressively started to emerge and made a point of saying, we don't do that type of business. As a result of that, customers in other parts of the world came forward and said, it's precisely because you're not doing that that we want to do business with you. And they gained far more than they lost. So there's a value of trust and there's a value of values. So what I've tried to cover this morning is about the importance of having a systematic approach to business ethics and a strategy for that risk mitigation. And that comes from the seven-step model that comes out of the research. And if you're interested in pursuing that seven-step model and you need any advice or assistance, drop me a line. So enjoy the report. Um, We've got, I think, soft copies going out to everybody. Today, yeah, today. Excellent. And um, happy to take questions. <laughs>